Hi, I'm Ethan Wong, and today I'm here speaking with Lainey Brown. So we'll get straight into the questions. Uh, something I've asked basically everyone is what's so special about poetry, as in why poetry and not some other medium? Or if you do do other mediums, what draws you back to poetry from time to time? Yeah, well, I think one thing that's so special about poetry is that it really could be anything and, and everything. And uh, I would never want to prescribe what that is for somebody else, um, but just kind of invite everyone to find out. It's often a language to inscribe something that's invisible or unsaid, um, or paradoxically, even something that is beyond language. Yeah, I think a lot of the times that I've heard people talking about poetry, and here's the issue with like um, kind of inviting people to poetry, it's that a lot of people have preconceived notions of what poetry has to be. And mm -hmm. an easy way to kind of break the ice in that conversation is to kind of open it up, open up the floor and say, well, poetry can be whatever you want it to be, right? Which I think is mm -hmm. very true. But at the same time, um, I want to kind of flip the script here because I think in my experience, this may not be as common, but sometimes when I tell people, oh yeah, poetry can be whatever you want it to be, they actually get intimidated by that because then they feel like they don't know where to start. So to those kind of people, what do you say? I would just jump in either by reading a poem and talking about it or writing together so that, you know, I think both both of those activities, reading and writing, are the best way to kind of get a taste as opposed to trying to describe this concept of poetry as a separate thing. Just have, have one experience of it and then have another experience of it. And then the more experiences that you have, the more you start to see what's possible, then so much is possible. There's really no limit to what's possible. Yeah, and actually um, kind of on a different line of thought, um, if you, since you, uh, as far as I'm aware, you also write like novels and fiction, mm -hmm. kind of, and this is very interesting to me because I've always liked to um, think about writing fiction. I never actually did it, but um, I've written a lot of poetry. So kind of, do you carry over a lot of skills from poetry to fiction? And what does that kind of look like in your head? Yeah, I, I've always been very hybrid. So even when I only wrote poetry before I started writing novels, um, I actually think I have started writing prose at a really young age as well, but I didn't take it as seriously as the poetry. Um, to me, it's seamless. So I'm writing and I really don't know what I'm writing for a really long time. And then at a certain point I realize, oh, I've written a hundred sonnets or I've written five chapters of a novel. So I move fluidly in between, um, but I know not all writers feel that way. You know, they want to, they're either this or that, or they really separate. But for me, it's always been extremely fluid. So a lot of the skills are the same. Although I think for me, prose is harder it's harder to finish writing a novel than a book of poems because you just, in order to step back and get a sense of the whole book, um, it's challenging because you have to keep reading it over and over again. And it's, it's, it's more words. Also harder to copy, edit, and proof. And, you know, it, it just, I think because I'm a poet first, it, I find it more challenging. Yeah. And to me, I guess something that was always, slightly intimidating was, whereas it feels like sometimes for a collection of poems, you could go ahead and say, these might all be kind of around a, same, a similar theme, but I can like write a poem and then almost just leave it until like the very end. But it feels like um, if you're writing something that is continuous, like a novel, then you get the urge to kind of like go in between each part and pick it apart every time you look back at it again. And mm -hmm. so I think that might be a big difference between the two, at least for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I wanted to kind of touch on this because I think um, something interesting to me is the subject of a poem, because I 
it, it depends from person to person. But sometimes even a question as simple or seemingly as simple as what is the subject of this poem can be answered in a lot of different ways and mm -hmm. can kind of obscure. So personally, do your sub the subjects of your poems tend to be like actual things like material things or like things you can point to or are they a bit more kind of like muddled? I think both. And I, I mean, a lot of the time I don't start with the subject or the concept i'm just writing or a title will come to me or a phrase or an image and i'm writing but i don't know why and so sometimes the place i begin is has nothing to do with where i'm going and it ends up cut out sometimes an image comes to me and that's the central image of what i'm doing or the central idea but uh i never know until i'm pretty far into it yeah. And then I find out afterwards. <laughs> yeah, it almost takes like a second reading of your own work sometimes to be like, oh, I guess that's what this subconsciously was about the whole time. Mm -hmm. And um, you mentioned something there, which was the central image. And I think I've read a lot of poetry where imagery is almost like the core focus in a sense. It's like just a single scene or a single idea it's described mm -hmm. in all of its visual characteristics, or you attribute a lot of visual characteristics to things that don't have visual characteristics. So for you, is poetry seem like more image-based or is it more like concept-based? I, I know that's like a weird question, but. I, I mean, so I wanna move beyond that binary there, but I would say it's language-based. My poetry language is, is the foreground and language is social and poems talk to each other does that make sense yeah I, I think so it's like they don't it doesn't necessarily have to be either visual or conceptual it's just kind of the whole i guess the way the poems are in, in their medium kind of binds them together the materiality of language like the way that a painter would use paint or a sculptor might use metal or wood or leaves. That's kind of how I think about language. Yeah, I yeah I see that. It's just because poetry is such, uh, I think, an abstract thing at times. It just is, I want to put it in these boxes to make it easier on myself to understand almost. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's so true of even writing it sometimes because uh, the way I've approached it, especially at the beginning was I never really knew what I was doing, but I would just kind of try to throw myself into the deep end and think, okay, after I've done that, uh, can I figure out what it was, what was even happening at the time? And I think that's probably for me, one of the, definitely one of the upsides of poetry because it feels like with a lot of, um, mediums, there is at least a minimal barrier of entry that you have to kind of know a lot of conventions. You kind of have to know what you're doing in a sense. And poetry, it's not that that's not true at uh, higher levels. It's just that you can get into it easier. Do you know what I'm trying to say? I, I think it's an illusion that we have to know what we're doing in anything. And actually, we never know what we're doing in anything, even <laughs> if we think we're an expert. And so it's just kind of the mind getting in the way. Oh yeah, that's also. So the, I, the, the sense of not knowing what we're doing, I think that's really crucial in, any, in anything we're doing or not doing because there's, there's openness there, there's room for discovery, there's humility there. If, if we're fixed and fixed and we think we know, that's kind of death creatively. Mm. Yeah, then things become formulaic in a way. And, so, the, so the one trick is to keep the unknowing to be friendly as opposed to intimidating. Mm. Yeah, to kind of accept it and just work with it. Mm -hmm. and, and cultivate it. Yeah. I, I think um, I'm definitely in a big place of unknowing personally right now because uh, <laughs> in, <laughs> kind of like in a creative rut, and I've been trying to kind of experiment to figure out what exactly it is I wanna write. Because I think in the past, I kind of fell into that pattern where I was 
uh, starting to know what I was writing. And I ended up writing a lot of very similar things. So I think that's definitely something I'm actually working on right now. Um, I wanted to touch back on uh, kind of a thread off of something earlier I mentioned, which was that about like the subjects of your poems. Do, do your, the subjects of your poems tend to come from your like personal life or from like the news cycle or what would, would you say there's even like a main source or would you say it's like very scattered? I would say everything, everything and anything, um, consciously and unconsciously, the whole world, every second, every book I've ever read, every, you know, musical composition I've heard, dreams, um, uh, contemplative, meditative life, the the world, all the events. I mean, and uh, all of it. I mean, not at the same moment, but <laughs> yeah. I'm interested in having poetry always connect me to the world more and more, as opposed to the opposite. Like, instead of becoming more narrow, I'm hoping that my interests continue to get broader yeah and do you ever um have there ever been moments where you saw something specific and that really like pushed you to just want to at that moment like sit down and write something and kind of if you have like what were those things just some examples yeah um I'm trying to think if there was a specific moment. Well, at a certain point in recent years, I don't know exactly when, I realized that I was writing, what I wanted to do was write books for an audience of one. Um, I wanted to write a series of homage texts to the poets I felt who had made me, particularly the female poets. And so, each one that I've written, there's there's a moment when I figure out the way the entrance to the project, whether it's formal or whether it's linked to subject matter they have or one of their particular books. Um, then it seems really clear when that moment arrives. Ah, I'm writing this book for this writer. Mm. Kind of like thinking about just like finding that point where you realize what you're writing about kind of helps you get there is what you're saying? I guess more uh, a sense of devotional writing, like collaborative writing, writing for and writing with and writing through and across time and in company so it's it's kind of it is kind of a gratitude practice in a way thinking about all that i've received from the poets who've inspired me yeah that makes a lot of sense actually just having that in the back of your head um and something i also want to touch on was you mentioned writing with other people earlier as a good way to get into it um could you expand on that a little? Like, what do you exactly mean by writing with other people? Sure. So I think everything is a collaboration, really, like our whole lives. We're not really doing anything ever alone. But of course, that could take a number of forms. So I have written books and poems with other writers um, together through the mail or in person. I, I wrote a book with Bernadette Mayer, who's a really important source for me. I wrote a book with the poet Leanne Brown. Um, I recently did a collaboration with the poet Sarah Riggs. Um, but, uh, but the homage text, I'm thinking of collaboration in that I'm writing through another writer's work. I'm thinking about their work and how I can write something for them in a way that's connected to their work. So like, for example, the most recent book of poems I had come out is a book I wrote for the poet Rosemary Waldrop. So she wrote a book called Lawn of Excluded Middle. And it's this 
brilliant series of prose poems and it's in conversation with Wittgenstein, this philosopher. And so I wrote a book in conversation with her book for her in which Rosemary Waldrop is the poet philosopher that I'm conversing with in my prose poems. Mm. So there's a formal relationship but then in, in the book that I have that's coming out in just a couple months, I wrote it for the poet C.D. Wright. And I just had one of her titles in mind, um, Translation of the Gospel Back into Tongues, which is just, it's such a fantastic title. And so I just made my title parallel, um, Translation of the Lilies Back into Lists. And, but then the, the form is totally different. It's a book of list poems. And then, um, it's tragically uh, so sad she died um, and I had just begun. She, I'd been writing it for a month and she died. So I hadn't told her. So it became an elegy then, which I wasn't uh, planning. Yeah, so in terms of writing together, it doesn't, it's not necessarily like literally writing together, but it's more that you write with them in mind, you write towards them. You write right, but it could be sense. literally. And, and I've done that. Too. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's like one great example. Um, there's a book called, um, now I'm not going to remember. Bernadette Mayer has a, a book called Midwinter Day that, that now it's become a holiday for poets where we read her book length poem every midwinter day with a bunch of people in marathon readings. And I think two winters ago, a bunch of poets somebody organized us to write our own midwinter day poem, midwinter poem. It has a slightly different title, Midwinter Constellation. I think that's it. It's just out. Um, and it was basically a Google document and all the poets, we would just write at certain times of day. So it's a multi-authored book, but it's also an homage to Bernadette Mayer. Oh, yeah, that sounds really interesting, actually. Just having yeah. everyone work together on the same poem. Yeah, and then like, okay, here's one other example. Um, the poet Hannah Wiener, who also is a poet who's really important to me, who I was close with. Um, now I'm wondering, did she come up with it or just participate in it? In, in it too, was a 315 experiment where we would wake up at 315 in the morning and write, like a, a lot of writers. I, I, I think it started with a bunch of writers at. Naropa University was how I first heard about it. And so it didn't matter what time zone you were in. You for the month of I'm for 3 15 a.m. And you you wake up and you write at 3 15 a.m. Yeah. Wow. And that also sounds interesting. What did you actually, I'm curious, what ended up coming of those those projects? Did you like all come and review them after everyone had written them or? What kind of happened? And a number of publications came out of them. One book called The 315 Experiment that had multiple writers. And it went on for years. I think it's still going on. Wow, that sounds interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if I'd be able to do that every morning, just wake up that early. It's pretty write. brutal. But yeah. then you go back to sleep. You write and then you, uh, yeah. And yeah. I stopped. Playing. I did it a couple years and then I stopped. When you did it, like, what was your production like of your poems? Did you notice like any change in the way your poems were in or like? Yeah, because I was writing on the cusp between awake and not awake. And that's really interesting. That's part of the project. Yeah, I have to try that sometime. <laughs> yeah. And kind of uh, before we move on to your poem, uh, yeah. I wanted to ask one final question, mm -hmm. which was that for someone who is not necessarily trying to get into poetry, but who has already kind of like dipped their toes, their like feet are wet, um, but they're trying to get deeper into poetry. What kind of like paths would you recommend in terms of like very practical things? Like maybe they wanna get published or maybe they want to kind of get into the community. What kind of things would you recommend for them? Yeah, so I think the most important things are to read broadly, to practice writing often, um, and to meet your contemporaries. So find the writers who are your peers, 
whose work is really important to you and your work is really important to them because that's how you keep going for the most part. I mean, I'm sure there's people who can do it totally without company, but most of us, we really need that companionship to keep going. And the, the other part of that is that it's a kind of do it yourself situation. Like if there's something missing and there's something you want, just make it happen, whether it's a reading series or a literary journal, an online journal, a press. And then the last thing is that it's, it's really live. It's a live transmission poetry. It's, it's not, poetry is not just words printed on a page. It's alive. And so when poets get together and they give readings, um, something really important happens in the space that is different than when you sit down with a book. So, you know, try to attend. I know it's, it's challenging right now in our COVID world, but there's a lot online that's fabulous that happens in real time. Um, and hopefully soon we'll, we'll be able to gather more in person. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And sure. if you're ready, we can get into your poem now. Sure. So I'm going to read a poem from um, Trent that is coming out this May from Wave Books. If you forget to send yourself, you never arrive. Place the book in front of you. Inside, imagine a night of blue stars dangling up from disembodied arms. Consider the way an artist employs gravity. What falls, hangs, protrudes, doubled over. Do tips of fingers brush ground? Place silver leaves on eyes to commemorate crying. Gather a spoonful of snow. Install a delicate array. A crystal aisle below eyes. I'll always miss you. I began this for you, but I hadn't yet told you. I'm telling you now, but you can't hear me. Of course you can hear me, but the place you exist cannot be gathered in spoonfuls of snow. In one of your letters, you enunciate who I am in my wildest dreams. I remember reading and rereading this letter when it arrived, but my memory pales in comparison to your words. I still use present tense because I must. In public, your writing is a gift. In private, I also guard and brood over your advice, remembering a primal sharpness and personhood. You introduced me to the selves I had not yet met. You introduced me to my mother and instructed me to spend spring break in the stacks reading her work. You set me up with my own best friend. A librarian showed me a photograph of the last quarter century. The same crescent fits into hovering. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Thanks. And uh, thank you so much for spending the time to be here today. My pleasure. <laughs>